Come on in, folks. Come on in, folks. You'll notice on your bulletin, on the front page of your bulletin, the article written by John Wallace without a name. It's anonymously published, but it is written by John Wallace. Come on in here. Come on in. Let's have a seat. Time is rolling on, and we really have a, a special place in our heart for this ministry and want to give it adequate time. I really appreciate John Wallace being up here. As you come in and settle down, I'd like to point your attention to the bulletin, the front page of the bulletin. Good to see you, brother. You got a bulletin? Yeah, grab one of someone left here. I'll wrangle one up for you. It's entitled, Some Things I Hope Will Never Change. Thank you, brother. And John does such a good job of almost poetically putting vivid pictures on the reality that we, he finds there in Ghana and what life is like there, including some of the challenges that he would like to change, but also goes on to list a lot of the things that he loves about Ghana and the people and the work there and what the Lord has been doing among them and through these mission efforts over the years. And then at the very bottom uh, it says, I pray that the Naples Church of Christ will continue to support our evangelists and that the generosity of our members likewise will never change. For the church to be able to go into all the world, it, it requires a lot of things. It requires organization. It requires heartless people. Heartful people, selfless people, sorry, who will actually leave the comforts of home and go into these regions. And I've heard from more than one person who has gone to Ghana, who came back uh, from many different congregations. A lot of churches do Ghanaian missions, and it's actually one of the fastest growing uh, regions in the whole world. Um, and they said, you know what, if life is just too hard there, I can't take it. Yet the Ghanaians live there just fine. None of them seem to complain about it. And sometimes it's just a perspective change that can open your eyes to the tremendous need and the value of Jesus Christ in people's hearts and, and lives. So, uh, John, thank you for doing this. Thank you for writing that article. Very beautiful and touching. And if you didn't get a chance to read it, I commend it to you. Did you uh, feel comfortable coming up here and letting us pick your brain on this type of thing? Not at all. Not at all, he says. <laughs> Maybe there's a button for, for John's mic as well in there. Okay. okay. Thank you. Keep talking, she says, okay. which usually isn't a problem for right. you. But this is. We want to highlight this trip, and I felt convicted by the Lord. And um, when John mentioned to me that there would be a spot open in this year's mission trip in July, I just prayed about it. And I'm one of those people who really doesn't want to leave my wife and family. I will have, this will be the longest trip away from, from my wife that I've ever experienced. She's probably excited about it. But this is something that I feel the Lord is going to bless. He has already blessed you and other people that you've taken, including many groups. And some, some of you here, raise your hand, in fact, if you've been to Ghana with John. A couple in here. And there's many more who just don't happen to be here right now. Lisa right here. Okay, good. You didn't raise your hand, but uh, glad that you guys are here. And anything you have by way of advice or information for me that will help me be more effective or help John not strangle me or along the trip, feel free to share with me and tell me so that that can go well. I want to show you the map, and then I'll ask John some questions. And he's brought some photos here. And, and I want you to think about the questions that you have, too, especially if you've never been or never seen it or aren't familiar with the ministry or the mission trip. It's really neat, and it, it really is a fulfillment of the Great Commission in a lot of ways. The church is an evangelism group, and it's, it thrills me. I love, it's like, a, it's like a nod from the Lord that we're on the right page with Him when missions are going on, and when we're sending people, and when, when baptisms happen, and they say the reason they were baptized was because of the study, or because of the relationships, or because of the people they met, or because of the preaching. And it's a team effort that, that creates going into the world and going into the culture and going into people's hearts and minds and lives and having them have the clarity and the encouragement and the opportunity to embrace Christ. And I think you're going to really like hearing from him on this. So am I right, John, that that's Ghana right there? That's Ghana. A small little one with a star on it. And why is it sometimes called the armpit of Africa? It's in West Africa where a lot of um, the 
diseases exist. Um, some of the worst diseases in the world exist there. Um, there are um, treatments and medicines available, but they can't afford them. So um, many people die, unfortunately. It's supposed to be on. Isn't it? We've got a red light. Is that good or bad? Red bad. light's bad. Hey, How about there that? we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah? Got it. Thank you. Okay, Kathleen. Is that coming so, through? Yep, it's coming through. I can hear it. Can you guys hear it? Yeah. Okay. So Ghana is in West Africa where the, most of the pandemics have happened in the recent past. Um, Luckily, they're not being affected terribly by COVID right now because they have protected themselves well. It's not easy to get there these days. Um, but it also has wonderful um, natural resources like diamonds and gold. And unfortunately, the Guineans don't benefit from that. It's all sourced out. Um, they only get the labor part of it. They don't get the benefit of, of the uh, resources. So that's kind of why Ghana has that reputation. As I was trying to figure out what all John does there, I asked him where all he goes, and it was difficult to find a detailed map. I hope you can see this one. John, walk us through where you go there, and there's actually a little laser light right here. At the, at the southern part of Ghana, along the coast, you'll see Accra. That's the national um, capital, also the only um, existing international airport, so that's where you always land. Um, Kamasi to the west is where Ben lives. And that's where we store a lot of our supplies. So we go there next. And then from there, we cover every region of Ghana. Um, we have 12 evangelists there, and we, they're spread out through Ghana. So during the five weeks that I'll be there, I will have visited all 12 of our evangelists. Um, Tim's time there will only be 18 days, so we're going to focus on some that um, I want him to introduce, or to introduce to him and, and them to know some of the most active um, evangelists that we have working in, in the Volta region, which is where the lake is. I asked John if, if life is different down here in the cities than it is up in the north, where I've heard it's difficult and sparse and very rural with very few modern accommodations and comforts and convenience of life that we're used to. And he said, yeah, in the cities, you, you, it's, it's, it's not really like here, but it's more similar to here. But in the north, it's like 1800 here. And he said, that's where I'm going to pin you. So <laughs> excited about and that. And the cities don't need our help. There are some of the largest churches of Christ exist in Ghana, um, Accra, and Kumasi. Um, I attended services there that have 2,000 people in them. So there, the, st the church is very strong. So they don't need our help. So we focus our efforts on the northern region where none of the missionaries get to go because they're there for such a short time. They can't get that far into the, to the wilderness. So that's where we go. We start there and work our way back to the city. Mm -hmm. What all do you do there? Yeah, I, know, I know that you, uh, you plan it for many months in advance. Months in and advance. There's a lot, yeah, but walk us um, through. One of the so. things that we do is we distribute these beautiful dresses that Helen makes for us. Um, she makes hundreds for us, and they're made from pillowcase, uh, pillowcases. Mm -hmm. um, so we distribute those. We also distribute um, life-saving medicines. We have a donor whose wife is a pharmacist, and so a lot of the donations that they give go to providing malaria medication, um, stomach problems, arthritis medications, um, medications for infants because there's a high infant mortality rate, um, a lot of nutrients for children who are starving and need a boost to, to try to get them back on track. Um, so we do that. We do, um, there's a Bible slide that we um, buy every Bible we can in the native languages. We take some English Bibles because our evangelists know English. Um, and they interpret for us. That's the valuable thing about having the evangelists on the ground there. They know the culture, they know the area, they know the um, hang-ups of the people in the area about Christianity. So um, we want to get these in the hands of the Bibles that are in their native language into the hands of the members. Um, the English Bibles go to the leaders. This is a motorcycle that we, I bought in the last trip that I was there. Um, we have to supply them and replace them often um, because we have 12 men. So sometimes what we do is the men in the larger districts will get the new one and we'll hand down the used one to the men in the smaller districts so that we keep continue to recycle them and we do major repairs on the smaller um, or the used ones before we give them away. And, and these are needed if nobody knows because they're basically are hardly any roads. Some roads are just goat paths and it's, it's dirt and it's treacherous and you see a couple of times here uh, what the roads are like. But, so these can go anywhere. They can go anywhere. Yeah. So there'll be places that Tim will be preaching 
that I can't get to because I can't go on a motorcycle. Do I get to drive one of those there? You will not. Oh. Because <laughs> they're not insured. <laughs> so what will happen is he'll ride in the back of one of these with one of our evangelists and they'll take him into an area to preach. <laughs> he'll pray before he leaves. And then I'm, I'm already praying. And then I'll go to the areas where I can get by, by truck so that I don't have to get on the back of one of those. In, uh, in the foothills of Arkansas and in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, I learned a thing or two about motorcycle culture. And it's well burned into my brain that if you're going to ride on the back of a motorcycle with another guy, you better be carrying a gas can. And you might want to bring your own helmet. They don't have helmets helmet? there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now there, it's quite common. Uh, I had a friend who was from Nigeria, which is only two regions away from Ghana, in college, one of my best friends, James Edo Ikulono. And he would always want to hold hands with me as we were walking across campus. Oh and I would say, James, we don't hold hands here. Oh, but brother, but brother, we are, we are brothers. And where I come from, this is how we bond. And men, men who love each other are always holding hands. And, and I said, there's some differences here. And, <laughs> and, and riding on the back of a motorcycle with another guy is one of them. So I look forward to that. Now, you, here, I think, are a picture. A couple yes. of interesting folks. Yes. Mm -hmm. These are two of our 12 evangelists that we support. The one in orange, his name is um, Mark Yabi, and he's from Ketakarachi. That's um, the, he's been with us for over 20 years, almost 25 years that we've supported him through the church here. Um, his support was subsidized by David Wakeland's father's congregation um, for many years, and they helped build the church that he, um, that he worships in and, and what have you. But now he is so well um, trained that he's trained other men to be leaders in that area, and he now um, teaches at this school of preaching there to prepare new younger men for, um, for the service. The young man next to him, his name is John DeBanyan, he, um, about six years ago, volunteered to work with a church that had no um, evangelist. He'd already finished his schooling, so he is our most recent um, added um, evangelist. He's our number 12 evangelist, so he's only been doing it for about, 12, um, about three months. So. 25 years and three months, but he um, worked for us about six years for free because he had already been trained. We didn't have the funding to, to support him, so we um, encouraged him to do the teaching that God would provide funding eventually, and a uh, family here in Naples Church decided to pick him up and start funding him um, from their own, um, own. We have 12 evangelists who are funded by the Naples Church of Christ, three of which are all individually funded. No. <laughs> sure, interrupt us, Russ. What do you want? <laughs> what would it take to support a minister? All of our evangelists, yeah, all of our evangelists are supported anywhere between a hundred to two hundred dollars. So the ones in the picture you saw, the newest one is at a hundred dollar level per month. And the gentleman who was in the orange, who has been with us for over twenty years, is at two hundred. We don't want them to become hundred percent dependent upon the church because if something happened and we, we weren't able to support them. We want them to be able to continue the Lord's work and support themselves and feed their families. So we don't want them to be 100% dependent upon us. Also, if you add up all the 12 evangelists and what they make in one year, it's about $20,000 that this church supports, which is less than sending one American to live in Ghana because our cost of living is much higher. We, our expectations are higher. These men live in the community that, or teach in the community they live in, they um, know the language and they know several dialects because in their area they can have many dialects. So they know several dialects. They know English. They provide us as uh, interpreters. Um, and they know the culture. They know the hang-ups that the people have um, when they're trying to accept Christ. So they're ideal to have as... Uh, and they can get in the water and safely baptize people and Americans can't. So, so for many reasons, supporting 12 evangelists is less than supporting one American um, missionary to send there year-round. Another there. <laughs> how long have you been going there, and how many baptisms average uh, a year? Well, Tim has all these questions ready, so maybe if you hold your questions, <laughs> we might get to that eventually. <laughs> Fine, I'll scratch those off the list. I'm going to go over us. It's a great question, though. Maybe you should sit down and let over, us uh, <laughs> over 20 years, hasn't it? Yes, um, the Naples Church of Christ has been um, going for over 25 years. Um, Charles Salmon started this program. I began going in 2000, so I've been going 22 years. Not every year was I able to go. During 2020, I, my, I had a ticket, but they didn't let me go because of COVID. And a couple other times, there were health reasons that I didn't get to go. But 
Um, I've gone out of the 22 years, probably at least 18 of those years. Yeah. How, how has it affected your faith over oh, the years wow. to experience this? I think that before I went, you know, when you think about Jesus' story, um, when he was calling the disciples at the Sea of Galilee, and he told them to go into the deep waters and start fishing, and that's mm -hmm. where they got the biggest catch of their lives, right? Um, I think I was a Christian who was kind of along the shore, like in the shallows of the water, but going to Ghana put me into the deep waters. I was able actually to reach more people and have a deeper faith because he was there with me, he was speaking through me, he was helping me overcome my hang-ups and um, to do something better with my life. Mm -hmm. It's become my life's passion now. Amen. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and, and Russ's question is fair. How, how have you seen uh, God at work through these efforts in uh, terms of what he's doing among so them? So many ways. Um, it's changed um, Ghana completely because it's the fastest growing church in Ghana. Um, our mission trips are 100% are focused on evangelism. We do other things, but they all lead to evangelism. Um, many groups that go there will do things like painting, um, orphanages, they'll do tasks, but they don't need that. They have all the labor they need because they don't have jobs and they have all the time in the world to do those things. So we go there with something that they can't do for themselves, and that's give them the love of Christ. And so um, that's our focus, and we've seen the churches grow like you wouldn't believe. There's hundreds and hundreds of churches there now that didn't exist 25 years ago when we started going. In, I think I was reading it, in 1900, there were about six and a half million Christians in the whole continent of Africa. Mm. Now there's 680 million, million. Christians, uh, which is twice as many Christians in Africa as there are people in the United States, which is, which is remarkable. Ironically, the place that the church is growing the fastest, where the gospel is going, spreading, and going most swiftly, is China. In the last 20 years, there, there has been more conversions in China than any other place in the entire, which you wouldn't really suspect. But Africa has dominated the last 120 years in terms of church growth and where the gospel is really, really effectively being embraced. Why is that? Why, why do so many American churches find it difficult to to attract the type of crowds and, and baptismal responses that you get when you go over there? Firstly, I think America has far too many distractions. Mm. We're um, lured away doing many other projects um, and activities. Um, in Ghana, their main purpose is to survive. So they spend their days hunting, gathering, providing, um, finding water, um, growing food, preparing food, um, bathing the children, they're very task-oriented there. They don't have a lot of time for entertainment or um, a variety of things other than wake up and do the same thing again every day. So when we come into town, we bring an attraction, something new for them to, to experience, which grabs their attention. Um, we focus on the children when we first get there because I don't speak the language. So while the evangelists are out gathering people, I kind of focus my attention on the children and, and start handing out the dresses, start handing out pencils, start playing games with them. Um, you don't need to speak their language to, to interact. So we do that, and the parents, it piques the parents' interest. Why are these people taking an interest in yeah. our children? So then they are more willing to come worship with us and study with us. Um, and they have a need. They still need God in their lives because mm -hmm. that's their hope. That's their only hope. Um, here in America, we become very self-sufficient, and we start to believe that our success is our success based on what we've done and not God's gift to us. So mm -hmm. I think they see it more clearly than we do. Yeah. Um, is it dangerous? There are dangers. Um, snakes are a danger. Okay. Scorpions are a danger. Um, <laughs> Africa has the most, um, most uh, poison snakes in the world, but there are precautions that we can take, and we take every precaution necessary. We never op use open-toed shoes because the soil there is so contaminated that you can get a really serious infection very quickly. So closed-toed shoes, we, um, we spray as much as we can prior to you know, using a room um, to make sure that uh, the bugs are not present. Sometimes it just angers the scorpions and doesn't kill them, <laughs> but, but at least you're aware they're there now. Um, let's see, the snakes, the snakes, unless you're in their territory, they don't come to you. So we stay out of high grasses, we stay on well-traveled paths, um, and we take a lot of inoculations before we go to, uh, to protect against disease. We're not, it's not mandatory that we take all of them. I take them all. But um, the ones that are mandatory are yellow fever and malaria, protecting ourselves against malaria. But the only 
way we can do that is through medicine, not through shots. So we have to take a daily pill for the week before we leave, the entire time we're there and a week after we leave. So um, you'll be taking it for about four weeks. I'll be taking mine for about seven weeks. Gene, our, our officer who most of you know, and who has been coming to the Monday night studies is, is a fascinating man. He, he said that he's going to Ghana as well this summer and he got a yellow fever shot in his arm. It's a live culture. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we have an appointment. You'll see it. I don't want to see a shot. <laughs> We're going to try to stab you as many I'll times as we can. Care. We have to um, protect people against tetanus, hepatitis, meningitis, yellow fever, um, typhoid fever, rabies, um, then all the ones that we naturally get here, chickenpox, diphtheria, polio, mm -hmm. shingles, flu, all those things. But um, those are not all mandatory. Those are just recommended. Just once, you, once you get vaccinated, you can go anywhere in the world, though. Well, you talk about shoes, you know, for yes. protection. The children there go barefoot. They're so used to it, and they can't afford to buy shoes. So yeah. we, I, if I get shoes donated, small shoes, I'll take them. Um, it's not easy to get them to adapt to shoes. They're not a society that wears a lot of shoes. They wear a lot of flip-flops. So I get a lot of flip-flops donated, and I take those with us, too. Yeah, but you know, it still protects the bottom of their feet from cutting, and you know, there's a lot of um, debris around that you can step on as well that can cause infection. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, very yeah. good. There Thank were, you. I read an article years ago and it fascinated me. <clears throat> I was running track in college and there was, it, we were reading track and field magazines and they said there were some pockets of Africa that because they don't have any shoes, uh, they're able to run farther and faster than, than the Western runners who had shoes. And so the African runners would show up to world contests, including the Olympics, shoeless. And uh, they wouldn't let them run shoeless. But they, they said that there's, there's too much restriction on their foot in the, in the sole shoes that we'd be used to. So the next year they came, and each of them had a piece of old tire tread. You know how you're driving behind a semi hoping to pass him real quick when, boom, one of his tires blows. And that shrapnel from his rubber tire throws itself all over the road and hopefully not through your windshield. But it does happen. And you can pick up these little pieces. And what they do is they put just enough to get under the ball of their foot. And they'd strap leather straps around them. So they had a tiny little, not even this big, of a, of, a, of a rubber sole underneath the balls of their foot. And their heels never even touched the ground and they can fly. Great question. A lot of practical questions. Uh, tell us about the planning process. What do you eat? Where do you sleep? Where do you go poo-poo? It's all so different there. <laughs> and that one's the most commonly asked question. Showers and, and where do we do our business? Um, because people want to know. Um, especially if they're going, they want to know. Um, showers take place in what they call a bathroom, because that's where you bathe, and it's a, it's a walled building about this tall that goes around three sides. You go inside, and you stand in there, and you bathe. And in Ghana, half your body's existed, or exposed, and that's okay because you're in there bathing. So when I'm there, because I'm such an oddity in the village, I'm usually the only white person they've seen for years, so I have to take a plastic chair and sit in there because otherwise more of my body is exposed. And he's huge. And, yeah, compared so to him, too. <laughs> more of me is above the wall than below. So I'll sit in there and shower um, just for a little bit of privacy. But um, we are an oddity there, so we get a lot of attention and we're constantly being watched. So you're always on your best behavior. You try to be the best um, example, Christian example you can be because eyes are always on you. Um, toilet things are different. I tried, I myself am not um, good finding a, a comfortable place in the woods like they do. So usually they will make arrangements that I can use a nearby outhouse if one's available. Um, so that's what they'll do for me. Um, either a clinic or a school will have it and they'll provide a key while I'm there because they know that we need some privacy. I thought I was going to have to walk privacy. behind you with like a scooper or a baggie yeah. or something. We'll, I didn't we'll know give you a little, I, a little hand sure. and yeah. Well, yeah. Um, but that's kind of how we handle that. But um, a lot of our needs are taken care of, um, not because we can't do it ourselves, but it takes away from the time that we're able to teach. So um, the women in the villages want to serve, so they'll be happy to fix food for us or wash our clothes or take care of things um, while we're teaching. And so um, they would do it for free, but I'd like to reward them with um, a donation so that they can help feed their families and stuff. And it's a blessing for both of us, you know, mm -hmm. a blessing for them and also for us to be able to help them. Um, go ahead. Life on the ground there is very, very different. You've showed some pictures here. Walk us through yeah, what, so what we're is, seeing. Um, and they, well, it's a typical road in the north, um, okay. and we may travel hours on roads kind of like that. It's washed out. It's yeah, a, it's washed out. You can't really see there too well how, how bad it is, but your truck never goes in a straight line. It's constantly going like this to avoid 
holes and rocks and boulders that might be there. These gentlemen, um, two are evangelists, one's my driver. They're excavating a large rock boulder out of the road so we don't drag off the oil pan. Um, and you know, this is just a typical experience. I love this picture because it looks like it's a black and white picture. It's actually a color picture during their dry season. During no. their dry season, everything goes brown. So there is no green to be seen, and that's the hottest time of year for them because they have no food, they can't grow anything. This day, we were doing baptisms, and they told me, when you ask any distance, how far is it to the nearest water? Oh, not far. Um, this day, it took us two hours by truck to find water deep enough, and you can see it's not deep at all, to find water deep enough to do the baptisms. Two hours by truck on terrible roads, but, um, but it's a necessity that's well worth the effort. I've never seen a baptistry like this one. <laughs> This, yeah, nothing hinders our, our, our efforts. Um, cows, there'll be people washing their cars. I think those are Cebus. Yeah, yeah, and so sometimes, um, at, if we preach at night, which I don't recommend that we do, um, you don't want to push off baptisms to the morning, so I insist that if, if I'm going to teach at nighttime, you're going to baptize at nighttime, so get ready. So sometimes we'll have to take the truck and point it across the lake, and it's just glowing with crocodile eyes. Um, but we get in and baptize them anyway, and somebody goes in ahead of them and stirs up the water to kind of scare them away, and then we do the baptisms. Or let them know we're here. Yeah, no, it can work both ways. Um, but this is a newly built Church of Christ um, in Ghana. Um, that's one example of what a church might look like, and we let them build the churches because we want it not to stand out in the community. We want it to fit into... Um, their building styles. This is another Church of Christ in Ghana. It's built with half mud walls and um, you can see thatched roofs. These don't last quite as long as the one prior to that, but sometimes there's not a building at all. Sometimes it's just uh, the canopy of a mango tree that we worship under. The, the topography, the, the architecture, everything is so different there. What are the people like? Are, it, is there a great and, difference? And in that there? differs from um, region to region. Yeah. Some live in round houses, some live in square houses, some have metal roofs, some have grass roofs. It just depends. Um, what was the difference in the people? Did you ask? Yeah, what are the people um, like there? The people there don't differ much, um, the, especially in the north. Um, only about 30% of them can read and write. So storytelling is really important. They need to hear the Bible stories so that they can remember them and repeat them to their family members and their children. So um, even if we, the crazy thing is, I can go back to a village that I spoke to three years ago and they can tell me what I spoke about the last time I was there because wow. they put everything to memory, you know. So this is um, a gathering in the North region. Um, they sit on these wooden benches for hours because everything I say is being interpreted sometimes once or even twice, depending on the, the group that's there. Um, then after you speak, there's going to be a lot of questions, and you, they will sit during the entire time. Goats will wander by, chickens will come in, but it's just a, such a beautiful and natural setting, and the people are very patient and eager to hear, and it's a wonderful experience, actually. You mentioned the, the difficulty sometimes in, in saying and then waiting for it to be translated, but th they don't mind. I think the thing you said was you're excited to be going because, and this is his words if I remember them correctly, there's no distraction of daily life which would prevent you from spending all day on the Word of God and that they're able and willing to do that. Right, absolutely. Yeah, huh. yeah. They, you know, they might have to get up to attend to a child or something like that. And when we have teens go with us, we actually use them to take the children away from the adults so the adults can even yeah. focus better. And the yeah. teens will then take them somewhere else and work with yeah. them and teach them and, and sing with yeah. them and we'll give them an uh, interpreter as well um, so they can do that. But, and the women, when the women go, it's wonderful because it's still a patriarchal society. Mm -hmm. And so the women are not praised very well. So when our women here go, they get to talk about um, the importance of mothering, mm -hmm. the importance of being a good Christian uh, wife and leading others to Christ and, and how important their lives and, and are. Um, they don't hear that enough there. So it's really good when we take women that they can minister to the women there that way. Here you can see some of the pillowcase dresses, I believe. And, and a few, the, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and this is one of the biggest reasons we go is because they are the future of the church in Ghana. And they are so eager and they are so happy when we come. This is a group of newly baptized Christians. Another gathering um, for teaching. I can't see well enough to see who the interpreter is, but every interpreter we use is a um, trained evangelist. So, typically... 
they're going to be way more educated in the Bible than I am. Maybe not you, but me. So they're a huge asset, um, mm. especially when tough questions come. This is definitely a picture of the girls yeah. with their um, aren't those cute with the dresses. Doesn't that look Helen comfortable to you? And, yeah. and then I'll tell you, it's day. like a it becomes a club within the village because <laughs> they all feel special because somebody five thousand miles away took the time to hand sew and hand make and hand craft a dress for them. That's very special. I have gone back to villages that I haven't been in for two or three years, and those hand those dresses will be handed down to the next generation of little girls mm. wearing the dresses still. That's how mm. they cherish them so much. Mm. I have another question. Sure. Go ahead. You know how in Christ, being Christians, sometimes uh, churches are, you know, uh, what am I trying to say? Anyway, my point is, do you have to have any protections? Is there anybody protecting? Mm, the that's a great question. I, I couldn't get the word. Yeah, that's a great question. So when we when we hire a truck, it comes to the driver, and the driver is key. We try to hire Christian drivers because they are your bodyguard. They're your helpers. They protect you in the driving process to make sure that if there's robbers, um, you know, if you have somebody you can't trust, they can call ahead and set you up for a robbery. Um, so you want to have a good driver. We had one driver once that was not good that was given to us, and um, the evangelist actually became our protectors. They would not leave us alone with that driver, so the evangelist, where we finished working, would ride with us to the next village and then turn us over to the next evangelist so that he was with us the entire time to help um, offset the effects of that, the driver. Um, he was, you know, not cooperative. He sometimes would refuse to take us to baptisms, um, different things. So, so we are very selective about the kind of drivers that we, we try to get. And don't tell Mrs. Neal, but it could be risky because there are a lot of muggings and you yes. could get a, a crooked driver who can make more money taking you to a place where the bad guys could just rob you right. than he will make off of your, yeah. your driving. The evangelists machines. are very good about also protecting us. So pray for us there. and our drivers and the interpreters and all the evangelists. Exactly. Um, These are my favorite pictures. Who, pictures all, who all do you work with and among? How do you handle the Muslim-dominated pockets mm. that we are We used to work you? in Yendi, which is a um, highly populated Muslim area, but we found that the, re the um, resistance to us being there was very strong, and it would kind of deter from our message. Sometimes they would set up loudspeakers across. We'd be under this mango tree, and they would, across the street, set up loudspeakers to try to drown us out so that their members wouldn't be attracted to the gospel. So we've kind of maybe avoided some of those areas um, because it is so difficult and it's not as fruitful. Uh, and there were times when we'd be teaching a group of people, and if some of the Muslim leaders walked by, the people in the group would get up and run because they didn't want to be seen listening to Christianity because they thought there'd be some repercussions later. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to cause that kind of difficulty in their lives. We know that they need evangelism. But it, um, in the time that we have, it's not as fruitful, and we have to keep moving. So before we get to this, Tim, I'm going to rearrange your um, schedule. That's acceptable. Okay. I am very flexible, brother. Okay. So really quickly, I'd like to go to the last slide. Not the last slide, but the 28. All right. Okay. Because this is a subject I least like to talk about. 28 is the next one, I think. But I've been asked about it many times. Not that one? Not that one. Not this one? Not that one. The funding. Ah, okay. Okay. That one. Okay. It's my least favorite talk, subject to talk about, but many people have asked how they can help. So I'm going to get through this really quickly so I can get to the more important parts. So our funding um, has been through private donations, uh, friends, family, um, neighbors, um, people who are just really interested because they've seen things, postings on Facebook. Um, the Church of Christ here has generously supported the 12 missionaries that we have um, on, on the ground there. And that was what this church does. But all of the um, money that goes into the planning and buying of the tickets and the work that we do over there has all been from outside sources um, for the last several years. So um, this year, a very generous couple, out-of-state couple, who have been on the trip with us before and knows about the work that gets done, has been very generous over the last few years. And this year, they are actually um, making a challenge to the congregation here. They are putting up $12,000 to match any donation that's given to this congregation so that we can reach our goal of $24,000 for the mission trip this year. So um, that's what they have offered to do, and we hope we, we hit that goal. Um, we're going to owe about six weeks to do that, and one of those weeks I'll be out of town for a week for surgery. So really five over the next five weeks, we're hoping we can hit our goal. But it's 
my least favorite topic because no matter what, God always provides a way. And I don't stress about it because it happens. Sometimes it happens in the last week before we leave. The money will come in. But um, I want to encourage you guys, if you're planning or thinking about um, uh, donating, do it prayerfully um, and do it during the time that these funds are being matched because it'll make us um, you know, be able to reach our goals. The um, time frame he said to start today, and he'll do it through the end of uh, June for us. Mm -hmm. So anything that's donated, even outside of here, like, like my neighbors dropped off a check yesterday at my house because they were leaving town today, mm -hmm. and that will even be so doubled. Write the check to John Wallace? Absolutely not. <laughs> 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 you write the check to the Church of Christ, and under the memo line, just put uh, missions, Ghana missions. And then if you have a specific wish, because there have been people who have donated for very specific things, and I won't make, mention names, but um, we have a sister here who always wanted to um, make sure that our missionaries had transportation. So she would write a check specifically to fund bicycles or motorcycles. And that's where the money went. So if you have a heart for any of the things we showed you, and I did think of something because during um, Tom's um, presentation, somebody asked about ways and the cost of things. So I kind of did a really quick list of some of the costs so that I could share that with you. And I put that here. Um, because, just to give you an idea of what some of the costs that we encounter over there, I don't want to take too much time because our time's running short. Um, so, some of the things that I was able to list were, a bicycle cost around $125, motorcycles, that one that you saw there, brand new, um, from China, is $1,300, which is a steal for wow. a motorcycle and the work it gets to do. Um, our supply bags that we take on the um, uh, flight with us. Each bag that we take over our allowed is about $200, but they are essential to getting all the supplies we need that we can't buy in Ghana. Anything we can buy in Ghana, I now buy there. Um, a church building, to build a church building in Ghana is about $5,000. Um, building materials, this is for replacing roofs, um, wood structures, anything that we need. There's around $500 um, to bring a building back to usability. Um, this year, airfare is outrageous because of fuel costs, so we're about $2,000 a ticket this year, um, which was the best. I, I was shopping, I was getting 3000 but the, the um, airline helped me out and got me down to $2,000. Um, transportation on a daily basis there, which includes our fuel. Um, all repairs to the vehicle while we have it is our responsibility because we're taking it to places where tie rods and uh, all kinds of stuff happens. So um, that, the driver, and the fuel and the repairs comes to about $200 a day. That's th this year's cost because of fuel costs being higher. Um, oh, Ghanaian Bibles, those Bibles you saw that I buy, I buy every single one I can get my hands on because they're not very plentiful. Um, those are about $12 a piece. Our, um, the orphanage in Yeji that's run by our brother James um, gave me a list of things that he, you know, his wish list. Um, about $12, $12 a week is what it costs to feed a child there in the orphanage, because they not only school them for free, but they also feed them. Um, the uniforms are about $10 a child, and a desk and chair is about $25 a child. So they're all, those are all different giving levels um, that you can consider um, when you're making your... And there's more in that list. Let me usher you forward, yes. because it, I can't even feed one of my kids one day for $12. <laughs> exactly. They get a whole week out of them. And then I want you to, to tell uh, this story that stands out to you. Some of you have heard it. I have not heard it, and he would not tell me before today. And I would like to get to you. Yes, ma'am, did you have a comment or a question? I have been to the clinic in Kamasi. Again, that's a wealthy area. It's in the Ashanti region, which is the gold district, and that's where most of Ghana's wealth is concentrated. Yeah, yeah. but I have, I have been there, yes. I've taken, actually, people who needed surgeries to that hospital to have surgeries done um, at our expense. And then also, we had like five or six weeks to be choose a donation item each week, and the church brings, whether it's crayons or I buy a lot of that there because it's available now, and it's better to buy it there, even if it costs just a little bit more, because shipping it, the cost of shipping will exceed the difference in price. But yeah, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Glad to hear about your work there. Yeah. Is it, yeah through, through Harding, I guess? Is it through Harding University? Well, they have nurses go to the 
That's where they go. Good, good. Yeah. Awesome. Good, good. Okay, so a lot of you have heard this story. It's Russ's favorite story, and he, he asked me to tell it a lot, but um, I've used it only once here in the auditorium, but I wanted to share it with you today. And I've practiced it a lot at home, but I'm going to have to read it to you because it's too hard for me to, to do without reading. It's about this picture here. Um, I, I call it the, the basket weaver. And so I had to write it out so I could get through the entire thing. Now, Robert already knows he's not going to ring the bell until I finish the story. <laughs> so he's waiting very patiently, and possibly even the prayer. He'll wait for us. But I'll try to do it as quickly as possible so we don't go over time. Um, so in Ghana, there's lots of these beautiful baskets that are handmade, and the ladies are really talented at it. But today I want to talk about this basket. So this year, I wrote this immediately after my trip when this story took place because I didn't want to forget the details, so I'm going to read you as if um, I'm reading it for the first time. This year's mission trip uh, began with a day and a half flight from Naples, Florida, with two short layovers in New York and Amsterdam, um, to Accra, the capital city of Ghana in West Africa. I then traveled another day west um, to Kamasi in the Ashanti region. There I hired my driver, Isaac, and a four-door pickup truck. We packed the truck with large rubber-made boxes containing handmade pillowcase dresses from Helen, raisins from the congregation, communion cups that the girls wash out, Bibles, a variety of life-saving medicines, and other miscellaneous supplies. We then traveled another day to Tamale in the central uh, region of Ghana. The following day, we continued through Yendi to the village of Zabzigu in the northeastern region, where I met the evangelist Ima Wumbai. If you're counting, that was five days of travel. Early in the morning the next day, Emmanuel instructed our driver to follow a small dirt road, similar to the one you saw, um, which eventually morphed into a footpath for what seemed like another two hours um, till we finally reached a remote mud hut village called Ansador. After greeting, after the customary greeting of the chief, which is the picture right before this, this is, what, this is kind of the tradition there. You meet the, grief and the chief and then you get his permission to speak to his, his villagers and then also you meet with his elders and you present gifts and, and you have a prayer and you know, it's, it's a very important part of the process. And we met the village elders, and we were granted permission to work with the villagers who had assembled in a large semicircle under the protective canopy of an enormous mango tree. Some were seated on long wooden benches, like you saw earlier, others on hand-hewn wooden stools, and still others sat either on the large exposed roots of the mango tree or simply on the well-packed bare soil. In the center of the semicircle, a chair had been provided for my use. The group welcomed me by singing beautiful, inspirational songs to God in their own local dialect. I sat in the chair provided, opened my Bible, and introduced myself to the crowd. As I taught about Jesus' parable of the prodigal son, I tried to make eye contact with each and every person who had taken time out of their life to hear me teach. I noticed an old man sitting on one of the large exposed tree roots. Next to him was a pile, you can go on to the next one, Tim. Yeah, next to him was a pile of um, fronds that were cut from a, a palm tree. He had stripped the soft green leaves from them. And as I taught, the old man carefully cut the bare fronds into strips of various widths. Listening intently to my every word, as, I was, as it was translated into his nat native language, he began to skillfully weave the strips into a flat disc. As I continued to teach, the, the old man continued to carefully cut and weave the palm strips into a basket. The longer I taught, the larger the basket grew. I was as intrigued by his basket weaving skills as he was by my storytelling. At the conclusion of my teaching, and after the crowd's questions were answered, I encouraged the group to give their lives to God. Many responded and wanted to be baptized. When I asked the old basket weaver if he was ready, he responded by saying, this is such an important decision. I should think about it overnight, and tomorrow I'll surely decide. Very cleverly, the interpreter asked the old man, if John were to ask you to join him and visit his home in America, what would you do? And the old man responded emphatically, without any hesitation, I'd go right away. We go today. But um, Emmanuel explained to the old man that God was inviting him to become his child and to live with him in heaven throughout eternity. But the old man repeated himself and said, I'm just not ready, maybe tomorrow. Isaac filled the seats of the, of the truck and the bed with those who were ready, and they left to search for water deep enough to perform the baptisms. Meanwhile, I stayed behind with the old basket weaver. I continued to teach as he continued to weave. When the basket was almost finished, I asked the old man, how would this basket be used? So he showed me the basket. This is the basket. It wasn't quite finished, but he was bragging about all of the uses that this basket would have. The gathering, tran transporting of items, storage uses, 
Um, this would be comparable to maybe one of our um, um, farming baskets, bushel baskets. It's not, it's not fancy like the one I showed you, but it's, it's a very practical basket. <clears throat> um, I then asked him how many CDs, which is their money, um, he would receive for this basket. And he told me the basket was requested by somebody else, but that he would be receiving five CDs for the basket, which was about the equivalent of one dollar. Um, I offered the old man 10 CDs if he would sell the basket to me. He quickly changed his mind, and he began putting his finishing touches around the upper rim of the large basket. Upon completion, the old man very proudly presented the basket to me. I carefully examined the tightly woven base, the straight sides, and the neatly bound top, trim, uh, top, top rim, and explained to him that upon further consideration, I decided the basket wasn't worth the 10 CDs that I'd offered him. And he looked at me a little perplexed, a little disappointed, until I explained to him that the basket was actually f worth far more. That because of the skillful handwork and the years of experience that went into creating it, that I was now willing to give him 20 CDs for his basket. He was very excited because it was far more than he'd ever received for one of his own creations. I did that mostly because I wanted to purchase the basket, I wanted to bless the old man, but also because I wanted him to realize that, like his own creation, it had more value um, than he realized. And that he, a child of God, a creation of God, had more value in God's eyes than he could ever realize. So then, eventually, um, the truck, the pickup truck came back, and it returned with all the newly baptized brothers and sisters. We had a time of celebration, but the time had finally come that we had to move on to the, uh, to the next village. But not before getting a final commitment from the old man that he would decide overnight if he would be willing to give his life to Christ. I left that village that day with many fond memories, a handful of new brothers and sisters in Christ, a new friend named Bielsen, and this, his handwoven basket. The next day, while traveling to another um, remote village, I finally received the phone call I was so eagerly awaiting. It was the local interpreter who I, I had worked with the day before. Surely it was good news, right? Unfortunately, it wasn't the news I was hoping for. Instead, he was calling to share with me the devastating and heartbreaking news that my new friend, the old basket weaver, had died in his sleep overnight. This basket now serves as a grim and meaningful but sad reminder of why we must go to Ghana, why I travel for days by plane and pick up truck on terrible roads and sometimes non-existent roads just to reach the villagers and to teach the word of God so that not another soul will be lost without first having the opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Brother. Uh, we're over time, so thank you for your extra attention. Thank you, Brother, for your heart, for the missions, for sharing, for going, for being useful in the kingdom. Can we pray? And uh, can we covet your prayers for God's blessing to be on this journey this summer and that he would be sending us basket makers with open hearts. Heavenly Father, help us go to every tongue, every tribe, every nation. Lord, we thank you for John, for his heart, for your son, and for his work in every human heart across this globe there is the need for forgiveness for acceptance of your reality and all of our feet regardless of where we live need to be on the discipleship path of Jesus and so we pray for success for this mission trip for John's continued health that you'd watch over him that you'd bless his body um, the upcoming plans that he has made that we pray that those would go smoothly we thank you for all of his efforts that he continues to set your mission and your kingdom and your church as the most important thing in his life and we admire his abandon of the American comforts and we know that he misses his family and church friends while he's gone but we also know that you have many people in Ghana who are yours and so we pray that your spirit would be lining those opportunities up, that you would be putting down payments and spiritual deposits in the hearts and lives of people who will be hearing the truth of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for the people in here today, that they will not be uh, duped into thinking that because they're not going to Ghana, that they don't go anywhere. I pray that you'll help all of us see where we go and the opportunities we have to open our mouth 
and to live lives that are observably different, shaped by the commandments of your Son. We thank you and we ask your blessing, both providentially, financially, serendipitously, Lord, we ask you to be a part of this and to be blessing it. We thank you for John. Thank you for this church. Thank you for Jesus. And the church said, Amen. 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 Thank, thank you, you guys. Have a great start to your week. Thank you. You could have ended on a different story. I know. I couldn't talk about fundraising after that. That's why I know.